will start the second lecture and uh, some students also requested me uh, especially for you who are recording this so you will get the recording in uh, so, uh, so this is the uh, last lecture we could not record because I was not feeling very energetic um, so this uh, this today's lecture goes beyond um, goes beyond uh, the discipline of uh, what I am teaching the course today because it connects uh, you uh, everywhere, including your mobile phone camera. So all of you carry your mobile phones. So what is a megapixel that you carry uh, your phone? Hmm? Your primary camera? Hmm? You, Madam Pragati. Hmm? You remember? No? Uh, Vishal, Vishal, what is the megapixel uh, of your uh, 48. 48? So, what does it mean to you? Sir, so it magnifies the. No, what is this number? Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean? No, I, I, I'll ask specific people so then you. I mean, you can meditate in your own brain. If you have answer, you can refine it, refine it, and then. Uh, Okay, so today's question is uh, I am not giving the answer because each time I go to the board and I explain what is a megapixel. So, uh, assuming that uh, the resolution limit is lambda by 2, and lambda, let's, let me give you, give you 500 nanometer. So, resolution limit is uh, diffraction limit uh, is 250 nanometer, right? So, if that is the uh, diffraction limit, 250 nanometer, this is the assignment today, third assignment, one question. Okay, question number one. It will, it will great, give your brain a lot of exercise and it's a very easy uh, question. It's not difficult, it's not technical at all, it's not out of the syllabus. So, so you have to assume uh, that resolution limit uh, for uh, visible light is 250 nanometer, assuming you are using 500 nanometer, just as an assumption, right? And we are using lambda by 2 as an equation for um, Calculating the distance between two uh, resolvable points, pixels. So um, now the question is that, uh, and the second assumption is that your uh, photo sensor in your mobile, the size is one square centimeter. Normally it is rectangular in shape, but I'm giving you a choice that you can uh, for simplification of the calculation, one square centimeter, right? You know what is one square centimeter? One centimeter by one centimeter. Yes. So now you can. Uh, the question is now. Uh, yeah, please. Are you in this class? Ah, you are there in this yes. class. Ah, oh, you are there. Yeah. So please come on time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is the. See, please follow this rule. Actually, uh, wait, serenity. Everybody get disturbed. Okay. <laughs> and all of your mature people, so. And now I have to everything right. So, uh, so if you want to uh, do some help to me, please come before that. Okay, that's the only thing I because I use focus. I need a lot of amount of focus for me to help you. So the question is that now to assumption we have made, right? What is the square sensor? Photo sensor in your mobile phone is one centimeter square, which which it is not actually. Which normally, iPhone is eleven or twelve. The sensor is one sixth of inch. Uh, I think it is around uh, five by uh, six millimeter, something like that, right? And uh, full frame camera, you know, it is uh, thirty five mm, right? You know, full frame uh, DSLR. So, um, so how many megapixel you can fit in there in that one square centimeter uh, sensor? Assuming the diffraction limit to be 250 nanometer, okay? And you will not find this uh, answer to this question on Chat GPT or something like that. You can try. You can try. Actually, you can try. I want. Uh, I'm not. Uh, not everybody. I want. Uh, I want you to try. Only he will try and he will. Let me know. I'm, I'm just curious. Okay. You try and let me know whether these kind of questions are 
can be <coughs> solved by ChatGPT. So I think question is clear, assignment. Okay. Huh? Uh, somebody, you ask somebody. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I do not repeat. Yes. Is uh, the people who were there uh, in the beginning of the class? Is question clear to you? Yes. Sir. And it is trust me, it is not difficult. I mean, even if I don't teach, uh, if you are twelfth standard student, you should do the solve. It's just a simple. Uh, some people are already getting the answer, right? You can, I think, quickly. You don't need even a calculator or anything. You can just you. I simplified the equation because I have given this one centimeter square sensor, which will simplify. It. And I have given you the lambda, right? And uh, you have to uh, you have to calculate how many. Uh, what can be the maximum uh, uh, pixel? You know, you, somebody said 48. So how many? How much maximum you can you can fit? I think it's also a relevant question, right? Isn't it a relevant question? Like how uh, how many megapixels you can uh, do so on those uh, sensor, right? How much you can stuff? It can't go in, infinite, right? Mm -hmm. Second, second. Uh, uh, this, this is uh, assignment number three. Second question of assignment number three is that what is the resolution of your of human eye? What is, what, is, what is the science behind that? What is the science behind that? Okay. What is the science behind that? And try to wherever you uh, wherever there is some deeper scientific questions, so try to put uh, some references. You have done it, right? So what? Uh, how do you name? Anurag. Anurag actually, then one of the, I think he also. Uh, Anurag uh, uh, um, um, sent me. Uh, proper DUI number, which I, I was very impressed with. And you also, Pratania, and you also sent me the reference uh, to the first question. So, if, if it is a scientific question, it requires you reading some article. So, it's a good practice. And uh, I like uh, uh, some people's answer, uh, particularly, I like uh, you know, your answer, your answer. And uh, uh, who else sent me? You also sent me. Your answer was also quite good. Uh, and, uh, uh, that is, and you can see uh, in live, uh, I will be uh, sharing the folder. I have made folder uh, for each student and Google folder. So all your answers goes go into your particular folder. And uh, so anytime you can go and check your folder, what is the progress? So I will be writing my comments. So what is wrong with that question? So you can you can go and check. Hmm? Will it, is, it, is it good? And also this uh, attendance uh, Excel folder <coughs> will be shared. Uh, so you can check your attendance, how it is moving, how your scores are moving in this class. So uh, and also this recording will be shared. So that's how you take advantage of digitization. And if you miss the class, you won't miss anything because you can uh, uh, you can read it uh, again. Okay. So uh, many magnification and resolution of many times we confuse right. In any microscopy, so for example, we we take an image, we magnify it. Uh, in your own mobile phone, if you just keep on zooming, uh, you think that uh, beyond, beyond a certain time, you start seeing pixels, right? Uh, have you experienced this? How many people have experienced this? Hmm? That you can uh, you take any image and you start magnifying it. Uh, and then now I'm getting better with the names because some people are sending me the assignment. So Archana, I remember your name now. Yeah. And Archana, actually, I know this name because you're writing emails back to me, right? So I'm feeling connected to you, right? So so I'm becoming also better, right? Because I should know the names of the students. Right? That's the first thing. Um, so the principle is that uh, you, for example, this becomes relevant because we will be talking about high resolution PEM, which is there at NCL, yes. and it is most sought after, right? Uh, uh, I don't know very, uh, I mean, he is a quite, the nation is quite senior student. So it's quite important for your research, right? High resolution PEM? Yes. Yeah. So high resolution PEM does not mean that you keep on magnifying it and, uh, and then reach to higher resolution, right? It's an empty resolution, right? So it's a fake resolution, and right? So, so unless there is a, so that's why you need to connect with the idea of pixel through that question number one. You, your mind will get connected actually to the 
to the to the idea of pixel, right? Unless you have uh, so it does not make any sense uh, if there is no information uh, there. Um, so let us uh, go. Uh, yeah. So magnification, we know that we uh, we magnify. For example, this image is a magnified image, so, right? So there is there is an object plane where the objectives are, and there is an image plane. Now, this, this, uh, this, uh, you know, there are several ways of defining it. The easiest you can you can learn, we shall that uh, this divide by the uh, this is the image plane. You divide the size of this by the size of the uh, object which you are magnifying. That is your magnification factor, right? Simple, and also it is it is uh, defined in in terms of ang angles because uh, it's it's a, basically the angle is also changing, right? We will we'll come to that. So, but the, that is the easiest definition, and uh, this we have already worked out the resolution of most of the microscopes which are dealing with uh, either electrons or uh, uh, or or, or uh, 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 even light uh, is. Limited by aberration and uh, uh, and also diffraction limit, right? Diffraction limit is quite uh, lower; it is a theoretical limit. But uh, real uh, practical uh, limitation is uh, uh, done by uh, uh, aberrations, right? There are two kinds of aberrations: spherical aberration and chromatic aberration. I'll go into deeper meaning of the aberration much later. Just take it for granted for the time being. Now, next slide comes uh, to you. Uh, so, how do we define mathematically? I will not go into the mathematics. I, I promise you, I will not go into the mathematics. Uh, but uh, here, you can get a fairly good idea how how this. Uh, so, two points, uh, and this will help you in the uh, uh, the question number one. Not necessarily you need this idea, but uh, uh, so we say that uh, to. to Two points are resolved, resolvable only when uh, yeah. so you can see that there are three pictures here, right? So uh, so you can uh, so I mean you don't trust your eyes, right? There has to be some uh, basic uh, there has to be some rational, there has to be some logic when you find mathematically when you say that these are resolvable. So idea is that uh, so this equation n by two comes from exactly same same concept that you find this resolvable. Uh, so you know that uh, the Young's double slit experiment and uh, right that uh, any any light source when you when you diffract it makes basically a central uh, maximum and then there are rings right. So it is exactly like this. So let's just assume that these are two uh, point sources and they are diffracting. So each will make uh, make something like this right. Make pattern like this, right? If I uh, so this is uh, this is first uh, uh, minimum and this is central minimum, and similarly there are millions of pixels, right? In your in your camera there are millions of pixels, right? This is for one pixel, right? There will be another something like this. There will be another. There will be another. There will be another something like that, right? Right, there are, for each pixel, it has to be like this, right? Got it? So, so these these points, when you bring them together, they will be considered resolvable only when uh, this uh, and uh, the central maxima actually uh, uh, coincides. The you know as as it shows the the first minimum of uh, the neighboring point. If the distance becomes smaller than that, then uh, they are not considered resolvable. Like it's already here, right? So this is not resolvable. This is resolvable, as you can see that this uh, this, this this maximum is falling exactly uh, where the first minimum is there, right? Hmm? And this this anyway is resolvable because it's like part part line, uh, right? There is plenty of text. So. And also, uh, if you if you take a image, this is actually a data. These are data points, right? In image form, but but if you see on the screen, you will see uh, something like central dot, and then you will see a dark ring, and then you will see a bright ring, and then you will see something like this. These are all A D spectrum, right? And you will see same thing for for another dot, right? And then you will see another 
Parang para na ito. Right? This is how every device, every imaging device works. Even your eyes, your mobile phones, mini camera, anything, even your set, even your uh, telescopes, to microscope, anything. Everything works on overlap is, you know, diffraction is the part of nature. The physics try to understand this, but diffraction, uh, I mean, this, this is these are laws of nature, right? Physics does not invent, uh, in, uh, invent you know, they, we try to understand, right? So, so you can you can see, so each is a, each point is a uh, pixel, so it, it it makes a diffraction pattern, and uh, so then when this uh, this minimum uh, is coinciding with this maximum, then if you mix, if you if you if you bring them together further, you, you, there's no use actually. You can't resolve. It, it will be all fuzzy actually. Huh? Okay? Is it clear to you? The answer is there actually. Human eye is around 0.1 millimeter, but I I am expecting that you can uh, give you, give a deeper answer. I right? I'm expecting that you can give more intelligent and deeper answer which uh, which will which will stand out. Your answers should reflect your personality, your intellect, and don't just. Uh, I mean, I can make up right? whether it is a Google answer or whether it is ready in your home. Uh, and sometimes I do the plagiarism check also. So if you are if you are just copying from uh, from internet and just post putting it, uh, I'm I'm doing more than a plagiarism check. So it goes to the authenticate. I have an authenticate of, and uh, I do it all the time. So don't. Uh, do the plagiarism, it's, 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 it's a bad habit. And especially, we are all our NCL students, and uh, you all know that how uh, this habit of plagiarism is taken very seriously, right? It's the most serious ethical problem, right? So don't, not, don't, don't, don't copy it. I will make up. I mean, there must be some errors in English writing, right? Not, not everybody, we are not native English speakers, so we have to. So make mistakes in English, no problem. Don't copy. I have no problem if you, if you if your grammar is uh, poor. Absolutely no problem. There is no extra marks for writing a better English. But I will cut the marks if it is plagiarized, and I will make out because it's not written by that student, right? And you can make out it. And there are okay. So uh, so these are the two equations. So Ernest Abbey was contemporary of. Uh, I told you that he was one of the first person, uh, Carl Zeiss actually. Carl Zeiss was a, a, a German um, um, businessman. Together with, you know, this Carl Zeiss not name still survives, right? right? You can buy a Carl Zeiss retro microscope, you can buy Carl Zeiss lenses, hmm? optical telemetry uh, lenses. So, so that it is Carl Zeiss that good. Hmm? So, but the scientific brain behind. Balza is uh, the company was Ernest Abbe actually. And Abbe actually gave this equation which we are still using. It's the numerical aperture, n is the refractive index, and theta is the half of the collection angle. Right? When, when I say that collection half of the collection angle, it is like this. So uh, considering this is the lens and this is the aperture, right? It can be any aperture, right? And this is, this is even in our eyes also, even in even in your mobile phone. Cameras, you have uh, mobile phone, you have three cameras these days, right? The difference is primarily aperture. Okay, so that becomes that. Uh, see, so th this is important a concept of aperture for, for day to day life as well as for this class. So, the third question today and, uh, is that uh, what is the role of uh, three, three different cameras and what, are the, what is the aperture size? In your mobile phone, I'm assuming that you have more than one camera, right? All of you have, right? How many people don't have a, a, a mobile phone which without more than one? Uh, you have selfie cam selfie camera. Even even if at the back side you have only one camera, there is always a selfie camera which is actually completely different than your main camera which which you use uh, to take pictures. So the, the question is that uh, what is the what is the role of uh, these three cameras? What is their aperture 
uh, three or four, whatever camera, even for even for selfie camera, you have to write. And you have to bring that mobile phone with you the next time in the class. Okay? And if you have any problem, you can ask. Me. Okay? So, so for example, uh, some people uh, how many cameras do you have? Pragati? See, she is doing a lot of Pragati actually. At least uh, four, four cameras she has. Hmm? Three at the back side and one in the front. So you have a you have a big more micro. <laughs> so she will take feature phone next in the class next time. <laughs> <laughs> this is my phone, Nokia, whatever, my whatever. <laughs> Ask me any question now. I have only one camera. Huh? There is no selfie, nothing. It will give you, it will connect you. See, I guess that you should, see, as a teacher, trust me. You know, a, I, I know that you are all kids student. But, but it will connect you to your devices. I want you to have some connection with your devices. I mean, forget about chemistry, you are a science, you are a science student, right? But it is not a big deal for you to just connect with your. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, don't uh, don't think that I'll I'll I'll, I'll you know, give you harder questions. But I want you to at least connect with the optics which you are. And it is a very, very basic thing, right? When you buy, go and buy, I'm sure that you are looking for number of cameras, right? Huh? Sixty-four megapixel da dena, huh? But that thing, you are looking at specifications, right? I'm sure all of you are looking at this question, yes. right? Yes, sir. And it connects with this class, this concept. And it will, trust me, it will, it will really activate your brain in the right direction. And it will take you better uh, business decision of when you buy next mobile, right? It will make more informed decision actually, and nobody will be able to fool you right Okay? So, yeah. So, for example, when you do Raman structure scooping, so you have, uh, uh, you know, Choice of using different apertures, right, for for different magnifications, right. So a different uh, depth of field. So, for example, if you if you if you see here, uh, you if you change this uh, uh, aperture size, the correction angle, so then your your resolution gets better, right. If you increase the, obviously you are you are increasing this. When you are increasing this, the R becomes better and better. R becomes smaller. Smaller is the better number. Yes, right? So if you increase this, but you cannot infinitely increase this. You know, you have to make big, 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 big lenses, right? You know the Hubble telescope? Yes. Huh? Hubble telescope had a very big lens actually, and you had, you had to cast the lens. I think, you, you, I think uh, some of you might have attended that lecture uh, on Foundation Day. Yes. You were there? Yes. Actually, right? Yes. You were there, right? So, and also I love this question about uh, Mercury lens and uh, so Hubble telescope had a problem of uh, this spherical aberration came to the public uh, domain. Uh, I mean, it came to public attention, not the public domain, public attention. Even non science people, because when Hubble telescope, because see, American audience is much more informed with the science section, unlike our country. Our country, the roadside person is not very connected to the space science. You know, they, they don't get excited so, because of the space. Uh, you, did, you had a bad sleep or what? Hmm? Don't lie from teacher. You had a bad sleep. If you want to wash your face, you can do that. But don't, uh, you know, yeah, be alert. Okay? okay. Take deep breath. Hmm? Because I want all of you to be connected to me. I, I'm, I'm making eye contact with all of you. Rotation. Hmm? So I can make out the problem. You had a bad sleep. Hmm? Yeah, you have to accept what is the perception. I also have bad speech. Anybody can. So, there's no crime in that. Anybody can have. If some mosquitoes are biting you, or it happens with me, you know, all my body is treating my mosquitoes. Anyway, so, um, so, Hubble telescope. So, how many questions we have already? Three. The fourth question is uh, what was the average <coughs> of the Hubble telescope? What was the size of the lens of the lens of mirror and the, of the Hubble telescope? And what was the problem with the Hubble telescope? And how was it fixed? You have to write in your own language. Aberration problem in the Hubble telescope. And how was it fixed? How was it fixed? Rajalakshmi, uh, you are writing in a better English language, right? I guess. Uh, okay, you have to. Uh, because when they, they, they write the questions, 
Even my questions are twisted actually. What are my points? Because I am not giving a written questions. Right? You have to write it. You know. So now people said that, that's what I wrote. Actually. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Obviously, biology is also physics later on, but the answer lies in the biology. Ashna. Cheetal, Cheetal Gaudi, right? Cheetal. I'm getting better with the names. Smita? Yes. Biology. Humidity No, biology. You're going to chemistry. Human eyes are more sensitive to the color. They are not sensitive to uh, indigo or so that's, that's the, and you can go deeper into this question. I think the first question is related to this. Today's first question, the human eye question. Second question or second question? Second question is related to this actually. Uh, so you can connect and write a better answer. Yes. So then if we do look at the early morning sky, right? So okay, that's, that's a different physics. So if you look at early morning uh, sun or uh, sunset, it is orange uh, color. Huh? What is the reason? Now your, your, your answer applies here. So sun is the farthest at that point. During sunset, sun, sun, sunset, sun is the farthest from the visitor. It's basically law of refraction. Yeah. So the red light has the longest wavelength and it is able to reach us the more rather than the other. Yeah. So it, here we don't use the law of scattering because sun is still below the horizon. Okay. So light actually bends uh, and then reaches to the observer. Uh, so it, it's the law of refraction, right? So it's law, right? So. Uh, Again, going before sunrise, like see, see half an hour or so before sunrise, but you can see the glow. Yeah, so that is because of the red light uh, get uh, you know the refracted and get bent and reach to your eyes, right? It bends more, right? it bends more actually. Hmm? So uh, I have a question like uh, we see a very light version of the blue in the sky. If our eyes are not sensitive for violet and indigo, we should at least see darker blue. At least see very light sky blue color. Okay, so that is because of pollution. Okay. If you go to the, uh, if you go to Himalaya and uh, you go to uh, probably Kerala, you will see bluer sky, right? Kerala, uh, bluer than this actually. How many people have lived in North? The sky is completely grey because of the this, uh, parali burning, and uh, so that brings the to another question. Uh, so the sky becomes uh, greyish uh, because see light. So you, you can you can assume that uh, blue light is coming downwards. Right from the upper atmosphere, uh, because of Rayleigh scattering, but now it encounters all kinds of uh, pollutants, particles, right, larger particles. So there is there is something called knee scattering and Tyndall scattering that happens. So the, the answer is actually the, what is the reason that uh, I mean I'm going slightly here of the uh, of the slavers, but no problem. You can ask me any question. So the the smoke is bluish in color. Uh, or or uh, grayish color actually sometimes, right? Uh, any smoke is, uh, you know. So uh, so the reason is uh, the Tyndall is scattering, and the bees scattering depending upon the size. If the size is larger than uh, lambda by ten, the particle size, then the Rayleigh scattering does not apply. So then you have to invoke that uh, bees scattering, and then for larger particle, then you have to invoke the Tyndall scattering. For example, there is some room uh, due to this. Um, um, some kind of uh, uh, volcano eruption or something. Yes. So these are different kinds of dust. And even, even if you look at the, even if you travel the, the coastline from uh, Kerala to uh, Surat, or <coughs> you see the uh, different uh, colors of the uh, sunset because of the local environment, the humidity plays a role, and, and the particles, suspension, suspended particle size and type of the particles, the refractive indices. It's, everything matters actually. Even the humidity matters. So there is a there is a there are different colors actually, right? Because of the scattering, amount of scattering is very. And if you, even day to day, if you go to the, uh, I don't know how many people have lived uh, uh, in a coastal home where they had luxury to see the sunset every every evening. If you look at sunset every. Every, every, every evening, different seasons, you will find the sunset is slightly different in color. You will start catching the colors of the sun, sunset. I teach it in a different uh, when I teach laser, uh, you know, the, the laser uh, scattering, light scattering, different. Then I teach, I go into detail and then I 
you know, I have a different course for my own students, I have different courses. So then I, there I go deeper into the life schedule, the nether particles and stuff like that. So there I go into detail of me scheduling and detail scheduling, their lambda dependence and so I don't have a slide right now, but my computer everything is there. So relay scheduling, uh, so relay basically, um, now we are, I mean, we are very close to the science way and uh, you know the contribution uh, uh, by C. V. Raman, Professor C. V. Raman was to uh, you know uh, explain the blue color of the ocean. And initially, uh, everybody used to think that the blue color of the ocean is just because of the re reflection from the sky. And he said no. And he was actually traveling by a ship uh, uh, to, to to I think to, to west, and then he was. Uh, thinking all the time, and then he reached to the conclusion that uh, this is not true. And he questioned not really, and not really is like, okay, bro. I mean, every, it was basically something which you are uh, uh, defying uh, big big man, I and mean, it, it was uh, like a glass baby. Those days, if you challenge and question uh, a big man like Lord Rayleigh, really, Lord, right? Lord of the Science, something like that. And Professor C. V. Raman was not that famous that time, so but he questioned and he questioned and then he uh, obviously there were some theories. Smackels, uh, Smackel had already given some theory uh, that uh, there is there is an elastic scattering of light, you know that before Raman, but it was just a theoretical calculation that there is a shift in the uh, red shift or blue shift in the uh, uh, energy, okay, but it was not experimentally proven or it was not demonstrated that it can really happen. So, so. First, the contribution of Professor Sivaraman was that he actually he demonstrated that uh, right, he used, he used a basic uh, spectrophotometer and then sun rays and then uh, he was able to demonstrate that there is a there is a shift, Stokes shift and anti stroke shift uh, and he used simple solvents and simple gases initially and that experiment was done in ICS Kolkata, right, you know that, that original spectrophotometer is key kept in ICS Kolkata when you enter the front, uh, the lobby in the glass uh, steel cap, and uh, his research was not funded by DST DBT, and it was funded by some uh, philanthropists. I think I told you that his research was funded by the Omvati Doctor of uh, uh, Krishna Paramans. I told you last time, and uh, his paper was uh, addressed as Bauer Kolkata. It was not an institute. Thing. Not only you by the National Chemical Laboratory you know, affiliation, it was just a home address. Okay? So, those days, you know, kings and some rich people could donate the money and you don't need to uh, fill the utilization certificate. Nowadays, you have to, every penny you have to. So scientists could spend time in science, forget about the accounting, you know, you used to trust. Now, BST will be banging your hand you know, for every money. You know, in next installment we delay it. So that was the reason, one of the reason that earlier um, the science was, uh, you know, you could get Nobel Prize, Nobel prizes and science was, the best science came out of before the, this typical government system came in actually. All this, uh, even this uh, ISC was funded by the team of uh, uh, Mesur team and uh, right, of stories are there, right? Okay, so back to the topic. So J.C. Ghost was a student of uh, 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 Lord Ray, uh, who missed the Nobel Prize, and uh, okay, so this is what this was a short one, and let me go to the next one. Now uh, the next slide, next presentation is. This is quite uh, involved one, and let's see. Now those uh, basic slides are over. Now we will be going much deeper and much more serious. So we start. Stay alert. So the next ring of Korean so, one layer is peeled off. Top layer of the right? Now we are going to the second layer. 
I will be revising it and uh, nothing new, but it will be going deeper into the set which you already know, right? So there are two concepts which are covered in this PPT. Uh, what are different kinds of uh, electron microscopes uh, we, we are using? Uh, we already explained uh, a little bit of uh, those uh, concepts, uh, right? The TEM, transmission electron microscope, and uh, scanning uh, electron microscope. Essentially, these are two broader categories uh, of uh, electron microscopes. But there are other derivatives uh, which we will. Uh, so there are like, there are different types of SEMs like environmental SEMs and. Uh, uh, somebody was asking, Tyler uh, uh, was asking uh, a lot about uh, the institute, uh, around the institute uh, uh, electron microscopy, and we had many discussions on, uh, on that. Right? So, so now uh, through slides you will be able to understand. So, but the basic concept you know that uh, uh, the transmission we are looking at the transmitted electrons, primary electrons. The primary electrons are basically the same electron which are getting. Right? So there are two kinds of electrons. One is primary electrons are the electrons which are part of the incoming uh, original electron which are uh, hitting the sample, right? And secondary electrons are the electrons which are not part of the original beam, but they are part of the sample. Because your sample atoms also can uh, you know the energy transfer and your sample atoms can eject the electrons. So if I use those electrons which are part of the samples. And I use those electrons to make it an image. So then uh, I use that term as scanning electron microscope. Then my detector will be at this side. Otherwise, my detector has to be at, at this side, right? So you uh, in transmission electron microscope, you have a lot of lenses and optics other side also. It's complicated. But here I don't have any uh, lenses because I have only lenses in this path to orient the beam. And once it hits and then I can catch the electrons, and I have a detector, I can just catch the electron. I know it's much cheaper, it's much easier, right? But there are limitations, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. SEM has is much, much, much simpler, and uh, we'll cover the SEM much later. Um, so, how, but to understand all these things, how does uh, how do electrons talk to your sample? We'll understand a little bit. And uh, when and why does an electron scatter? Why should an electron scatter? We already answered that in the first class, right? Electrons scatter because of the change in the Coulombic potential, right? So nothing is actually new, right? First, first question we already addressed in the first class. Second question also, if you if you remember, right? And uh, third question, what do we learn? From I mean, what do we learn? But that that was also uh, answered in, uh, in the first class. We learned about uh, uh, topography. We learned about uh, uh, crystallography. How the atoms are arranged in the lattice. All of your atoms and uh, where is the vacancy and what kind of atoms are present. Right? These three questions we already a little bit discussed, right? In the first class, do you remember? Hmm? Yes, sir. So nothing new, nothing new actually. These three questions we are addressing uh, all the time. So that's it. So electron microscopy, only three questions we need to ask, nothing else. There's no other question actually. Because these three questions are relevant to uh, a chemistry student, right? I'm sorry, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm avoiding physics term because uh, I don't want students to get uh, uh, Overwhelmed or a little bit intimidated by physics, right? Uh, this course is designed in a broader uh, way. So, are you okay, Vishal? You are very <laughs> tortured. Huh? I'm sure that you will, it will help you. And these, these three questions, and trust me, uh, as a teacher, these three questions are beyond electronics. You might be wondering why you need to, I mean, Learn too much for just for electron microscopy? No, not at all. You will learn so much. You will learn about XPS here, SP for electron spectroscopy. You will learn Raman here in this class. You will learn through these questions. You will learn about uh, EDAX. 
you will learn about X ray photo electron spectroscopy, all kinds of, uh, yeah, so, so SRD, everything will be covered here, right? Because when you, for example, when, when, when I mean, already you answer about X ray diffraction, right? In the assignments, right? I have this question about X rays, right? Why X rays don't talk to the nucleus? Yes. It's already connected the, the new with the X rays, right? Not just electrons. And many of you have answered uh, quite nicely, mm -hmm. but I was expecting some deeper answer, some more uh, quantum chemistry related answer, but so far I am yet to get, or maybe I did not check for all the uh, answers, but I am expecting a better answer. Uh, uh, it should not be the same, I mean, some hint I gave in the class, but it should not be, your answer should not be the same which I uh, entered the class. You can go to the deeper level. I mean, I'm, you're not limited to what the answers which I gave uh, in the class itself. So I was expecting the answers will be better in this question. Uh, okay. So if, if uh, people who want to revise uh, your assignments, uh, you can still do that. But I want better answer to this question. The trust me, is serious. What is the reason that X rays don't enter uh, when you don't image uh, nuclei, only the electrons? So, uh, so you have two kinds of uh, interactions. Uh, so, so you have uh, you have basically lasting interaction, lasting interactions, and uh, the inelastic interactions. So, electrons get scattered and diffracted inside the matter, uh, right? So these are, I will explain the difference between just, just the scattering and, and diffraction. Diffraction. Of course, diffraction is part of the scattering. Scattering is a larger, uh, larger term. But diffraction is mostly for wave scattering, wave, wave phenomena, right? When we say diffraction, we invoke the wave nature of a particle. When we say scattering, we invoke the particle nature, right? Hmm? Okay? So when we uh, talk about wavelets, then Obviously, they, they, they will merge, and then uh, if there is any uh, coherence between these waves, uh, then uh, so coherence coherence is actually very simple uh, simple to explain. Coherence between waves. Which one can you come? To? I will explain the coherence. Who are giving the mark? So coherence is actually uh, from here. Okay, oh, you just stay there. Coherence is basically that, uh, yeah, so uh, right first, okay, this is coherence of waves, okay, right. okay, now coherence is also, so this is also coherence, and uh, this is also coherence, uh, when I say, when I put right, you put left, this is also coherent. so there is an ordering, there is a phase lag now, also. there is a phase lag, but it is, there is a certified, there, there is a defined phase lag. It's not like, you know, now just walk randomly, without, without anything. These are only in coherence. There is no, there is no, so there, there is no connectivity. Okay? Time and space. So when I say time space, so there is a coherence between when we are moving, moving the lag, and also how, how much distance we are covering. Space and time. Concept of time is space. You got my point? There are two concepts actually. Space that how much uh, what is our step uh, step this thing how much step we are taking how much distance we are covering and also when whether there is any coordination it does not mean that uh, his left leg is coming forward and my right but it has to be like that all the time or it must not change during the duration of propagation of these waves uh, and also the step so then you can if you know my original position and his original position after some time. You can actually calculate his position and my position. If the steps, step size and the and the then their frequency is same, if if he is walking randomly and I am walking randomly, you cannot calculate. You cannot calculate the distance between me and him after certain time. Okay. Oh, and also there can be a step. This step can be longer. The uh, stance can be longer than mine, but it has to be remain like that. In the wave also, it is like that. Okay, so th this is called temporal and spatial coherence in a simple way. 
Is it a nice way to explain? Easy way to explain, right? It's a must to chemistry students, I find it much easier to explain. So there is a uh, temporal and spatial coherence. And there is a coherence between the waves, then only you can they will diffract, otherwise they will not diffract. You cannot you cannot make out any part difference. You know, there is no you cannot have any Bragg situation. You cannot calculate in order to have a Bragg's law, you need to have a part difference. You know, it has to be multiple of uh, n lambda, right? And lambda is to be size theta. Right? Otherwise, if it is if the, both the waves are basically going in their own way, after a certain time you have to calculate the R difference, right? If it is integer but multiple, then you say that there is a uh, there is a construct, uh, constructive difference, and if it is cancel, then there is a cancellation, right? Um, right? Peak and rough, uh, you know those those things are merging. Then there is a destructive difference, right? There is a, you know there is a minimum and maximum, right? Yes. And in between also. That's how interference pattern forms between the waves. And so, in electron microscopy, there will be some, there will be uh, applications, and the application is there at, at NCL, which is called HADA, high, high angle annular dark field mode. So there in HADA mode, these waves, these electrons actually, after scattering from your sample, they get, they lose their coherence. Because of high angle. Now, why do they lose coherence? We we'll discuss here. And so, these signals were considered as nuisance, the jump signal. There's, there's no application. But then uh, people realize that because you cannot make, it, I, as I as I mentioned, that is there, there's no coherence. There's no so you cannot uh, get any uh, crystallographic information, structural information, right? I want to know. See, there are two questions for the chemist. That where my atoms are placed, in which structural order? Second question, which chemists want to know, but what kind of atoms are there? Yes. So, first question cannot be answered if it is not, there is no coherence. But the second question can be beautifully answered that what kind of atoms, what is the Z number? If the first first type of thing is, uh, uh, you know, that coherence is lost, so that uh, the high end is. Electrons which are getting scattered at high angle are used for elemental map. Beautiful. Yeah. So if you have some composite material, so you can use that high angle. I will explain part of the is there at NCL. I mean, not from today, but from uh, long, long, long back. So that can that you can use immediately to image the sample. Image the sample means suppose you. Use convergent B instead of this this kind of B. If you if you if you use this B, uh, it's harmless. So I'm pointing at you. So for example, this is sample, and I'm shining the electron B, and I'm I, I'm shining I'm shining on him, and uh, so he's an atom. Uh, so I'm shining electron B on him, and I'm I'm uh, he uh, I'm getting those high angle uh, scattered electrons. So I capture that. It will tell me what is what kind of atom he is. Then I bring it uh, to, to, to him, and to he, here I, don't, I will not find any atom, and here, here, here. So I can scan, <coughs> I can do the scanning, and the, the resolution of my scanning will depend how fine my beam is, how narrow my beam is, right? Got it? So that, that will, so then this diffraction law, lambda by 2 does not come into picture here because I am not using diffraction because I, I can make my electron beam narrower and narrower and I can I can focus it on few atoms or one atom or few not one atom probably not here at NCL but at least few atoms at least I should be able to do okay very limited area at least one nanometer uh, area right I should be able to uh, focus then I can get actually pointed information suppose I want to do the mapping of my RDB, right? Suppose I need some catalyst and I want to see that where I have wrote something, where the, where is it goes, where are the oxygen atom, where is zinc atom, and where is, where is this platinum atom. Suppose I made an exotic catalyst for some automobile. Hmm? I want to, I want to, first thing I want to know that what is the spatial distribution of these atoms? And if I if I just try and illuminate entire area, 
I, I, I don't learn anything. It will give me average out number actually. Right? It's a problem with, uh, with the, uh, uh, this uh, inductive couple ICP also. ICP will give you just average out number, right? You just dissolve the sample in acid, right? Run uh, ICP. It will give you the atomic percentage in the entire sample, right? It's a broad, broad sample. Now you see, this is the only technique where you can you can say that the location of uh, particular atom, not just the overall concentration, you can get localized information, right? For example, in a forest, whether there are jamun trees and how many jamun trees and how many mango trees, this is one kind of information overall. But I want to know that uh, on, on a particular mango tree, how many mangoes are there? So this information, is the localized information, is you will get to know how in this class. Edex is also a, 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 a tool which is which can be taught here. Edex can also give you uh, elemental <coughs> chemistry information, right? But again, uh, there are two ways that you can get the Edex from a larger, like uh, 200 nanometer by 200 area, for example, entire illuminated area, uh, or you can uh, narrow your beam and you can get EDX signals from, from a tiny area at one time. So you can do the mapping. So the narrow continuum, the thrusting pattern. Thrusting, yeah. So there are two other coils. So the, the combination of the, these two things is called STEM. So you are taking that one, you are scanning, but you are doing the uh, in the transmission mode. You can do it in the uh, that mode also. Why the mode? No problem. So, <laughs> so there is third one. Yes. So I have doubt at this point. So how do you like you know literally determine which method to use? Like how do I call like e that's method? That's why you are at the class. Good, good. So these questions will be uh, will be good actually. So uh, this this question will be debated in the class. You have longer to go. Okay. So the question is that, how do we know that which, uh, which technique we can use, right? Uh, you'll learn quite a lot. Uh, only thing is that you have to uh, um, you know, consistently attend the class. Otherwise you will miss the uh, you know, this sequence actually. Okay? So there is a third uh, branch. Um, yeah. So now, the next question is, so yeah, so when electrons, so now we, we understand starting in diffraction, so when electrons travel through an environment with uniform potential, they will not stack. So there is no change in the potential, Coulombic potential. So there will, there will not be any scattering, they will just feel that it is transparent. <coughs> okay. For example, vacuum, there is no atom, then they will just travel, electrons will travel, they will not scatter. Right? For example, light, when do the photons scatter? When, when does light scatter? Light scatter when there is a change in the uh, refractive index or dielectric constant, both are the same. When there is an inhomogeneity, suppose light is traveling in the medium where there is no change in the refractive index, light will not scatter. Light scatters when it enters from one medium to another medium and there is a change in the uh, refractive index, right? It changes, right? For example, we got this uh, uh, project from Asian Trades uh, recently. Uh, to uh, work on the anti refractive coating section, so on the solar photovoltaics, right? So, big one. Uh, so, so, they have made this anti refractive coating. Uh, so, they, they, they gave us uh, this problem that can, can you. So, uh, so, what exactly happens that um, you have the solar photovoltaics, solar big panels, silicon panels, and light is, so light is coming from air to penetrate to the silicon. So, a so lot of light gets reflected back. So, there is a Sudden change in the refractive index, sudden increase in the refractive index, right? So uh, nowadays they don't just expose this uh, expensive silicon to the outer environment. There is a glass, protective glass actually, over there. So protective glass, regular glass also the refractive index is around 1.6, whatever, right? And then uh, air refractive index is 1. So immediately from 1 to 1.6, there will be photon will be bouncing back. So they have uh, corrugated the uh, Glass, uh, anyway, to this it's not a very good thing. But they made a coating actually. Um, there is no uh, conflict because I don't know the coating material, I don't want to know. But uh, so, so basically, on glass, you make intermediate, I mean, this solution is already in the liquid. And the reflected coating idea is that so between 1.6 to 1, you have to have 
make another material again polymer it can be phenolic and pour it over glass so the refractive index should be of order of 1.4 or 1.3 or you know it should be somewhere in the middle so light photons don't directly uh, come from 1 to 1.6 but there is an intermediate uh, layer so there is a gradual uh, like onion structure right? so, so the photons uh, will not it will be absorbed uh, uh, it will be entering inside um, uh, the silicon much more efficiently so you can increase the efficiency of uh, uh, silicon existing silicon uh, uh, cell quite uh, prominently um, so they wanted to know the refractive index so it was quite, chill, quite challenging so, uh, so So, what is the fundamental difference between the way electrons or photon scatter? I just explained. Okay, that's the next slide. So, photon uh, scatter, uh, like photons can be like you know your UV visible and uh, you do this Raman and you do this uh, FTIR. Where you are doing this, you are dealing with photons all the time. Right? So, photons are actually, uh, so electron is a low mass emitting the charged particles. As such, it can be deflected by passing close to the electrode and the positive nucleus. That is vibrations. Phonons also tend to scatter electrons, right? Uh, I told you that atoms are not stationary; they are moving, right? Yes, so they will also scatter. Uh, there will be also role of uh, electron scattering or photon, photon scattering, right? If you heat up the sample, there will be more scattering. Mm -hmm. yes. So what are phonons? Phonons are basically, uh, phonons are basically, for example, uh, easiest way is, is to, to explain. Uh, you know this, uh, you know this uh, fans, uh, fans is there that mesh, uh, the, uh, that jali uh, hoti right? That mesh, iron mesh. So if you take a stick and beat one side with this stick, so it, it resonates, right? The, and then the resonance actually, you know, it starts vibration, vibrating. Vibrating and vibration actually propagates yes. to the left side. Yes. So that's called similarly to the phonon side. So if you heat, uh, so this is this is we are all a collection of atoms. So if I heat this side, so this will vibrate, right? This will vibrate more and more. So this will be if it is connected in a lattice in a crystalline order. So then there is a wave of uh, uh, you know like uh, vibration. So this can be a trans transverse, but it can be longitudinal also. It can, so vibration can be like this, you can vibrate like this, or you can vibrate like this also. So suppose you're, you're, uh, you're, uh, you have basically like a, a cation and you have, you, have, you have an ionic lattice. So what will happen that in ionic lattice, cations and anions will have different, you know, anions will move like this and cations will move differently. Because, because of light has, light has, light has electric vector. So electric vector is suppose so electric vector goes like this positive, positive, negative, positive, positive. So if you have ionic lattice, so when the positive side of the wave will drag the anions this side and cations away and vice versa. So it is so suppose suppose you take just gold, so there won't be that kind of a wave hmm? because there is no cation anion, it's not an ionic lattice for metals. So that, that interaction will be different. There are different kinds of phonons, like acoustic phonons and uh, optical phonons. The acoustic phonons travel the sound. You know, you might, uh, you know, when, when your kids actually you might have done this experiment, that when you uh, go to the train tracks, you can hear yes, uh, on the metal, you can hear the uh, sound waves traveling faster. So, why does sound travel faster through the metal? So, those are acoustic phonons actually. Optical phonons, so they follow a different uh, energy and uh, momentum equation, right? That passes through for zero momentum, zero energy, right? For optical phonons, it's not it's it's not true actually, right? So uh, optical phonon EK diagram is different. So chem in chemistry, for like modern chemistry, they don't uh, study the. Uh, for example, uh, in organic chemist, chemists, they study phonons all the time. So they are working on solids, right? Whenever you have ordered ordered stuff, you have to have phonons. You want to see. 
So only people who can escape from one is, is Vishar. Wherever you have isolated molecules, so then there is no concept of uh, phonon because it is an isolated collection of. So then you talk about uh, then you talk about vibrational spectral, vibrational rotation of molecules, right? For example, in water, liquid, I can't <coughs> have concept of phonons because each molecule will have their, its own degree of freedom. It's not connected with another water molecule, right? But in solid. The atoms are connected. So the vibration of one part of the solid will be propagated depending upon the crystallinity to the other part. That's what you do in, uh, that's what you study in Conductor. Raman, Raman spectroscopy. You look at the phonon spectrum. If you do Raman on solids, any solid, what you get is the phonon spectrum. I will be teaching phonons in this class, don't worry about it. So how do I this phonon? Oh, anyway, I should not have discussed it right now because I forgot that this is part of this Raman I will be teaching. So I will be teaching in detail phonons. You must be knowing both of you uh, phonons are huh? or no. So be honest, no problem. Because I am a teacher and you are a student, so you are not so hmm? little bit, huh? So your MSC was from where? Asanso. Which Asanso University? Kumau University. Where is where exactly? Nanita. Nanita. How is that university? I don't know anybody here. Um, there. Okay, okay, not so. Okay. You are feeling happy in this class? Yes, sir. Very happy or a little bit happy or hated <laughs> or, or, happy. Hated or uh, bliss or uh, what? Huh? Yes, sir, happy. Just happy. No, sir. Okay. <laughs> It's justice to me, right? Really? I'm putting so much of hard, hard work and I asked, sir, are you happy or very happy? She said, just happy. No, sir. <laughs> okay. So what is your right answer? Sir. <laughs> sir, very happy. Very happy? Okay. So in a sense, both... Uh, so there is a lot of text you can read. Okay, I'm not going to read. I already talked about this thing. So, let's go. Uh, so, this is for you guys. Uh, I find it very boring to read. But, and I cannot pay attention there to my slides. I don't really, really know what is there in my slides. I'm just, I don't need slides actually. Right? I mean, slides are for you guys. Uh, somebody asked this question? I was expecting more questions actually. Rajalakshmi is good in asking questions, but nobody else asks questions. And a couple of what? Huh? You should ask questions if you. Uh... Sir, I have one question. Sir, as the, I need a particle which gives out electron, then, then it must get instable, unstable. Good, good question actually. So, yes, you are right. So, uh, Ideally, each each matter is supposed to be neutral, right? In actually, it is not neutral. Right? Uh, there is always, you know, that from your school days, that there is some charge, surface charge, yes. right? Um, but if it is the nature of the nature of any any matter, if, if it is charged, then it will find a ways to uh, uh, remove the charge. It will find ways to neutralize. The nature of uh, uh, that's the nature of the nature, right? Any, any, right? So that's why you have this uh, lightning bolt running towards the earth. You have the accumulation of dust particles on uh, uh, television screen. There is a more proportion of dust settling on the television screen. Old fashioned television screen, I'm talking about cathode ray tube, where, where normally, so that, that answers, I'm giving some examples. So. So you are charging constantly, you are throwing electrons onto the television screen. So you are charging it up, right? So then you have so you dust. Suppose there, are, there is a counter, counter charge, positive charge of the dust particle. So dust particle will tend to settle more on the. So that is one of the technique which is used in the filtration of uh, this coronavirus and uh, even the dust filtration in the ACs. So, so then you can have uh, uh, charged filters. 
So then you can trap the dust back there and the remote data formation. The data formation in Bengal. Huh? So all these, uh, uh, the river which originated from Bomuk, right? From, okay, the Gandhi's, you know, Alamal Bank and Gandhi's, you know, guys. So they are carrying uh, all kinds of uh, Himalayan dust, actually, right? And it, it goes and it is charged. <coughs> Those are charged particles, right? Charged uh, sand, sand particles, you know, all these silicates and all kinds of things. Uh, phosphates and silicates. So in river water, uh, they remain suspended, they are charged, they can get very forward. The moment they uh, reach to West Bengal, they meet the ocean there or the sea actually, Bay of Bengal, then you have this counter ions, magnesium, sodium, salt water. So they so it neutralizes those charged particles. Immediately you have all the the circuit and it forms the data, you know, the data for me, immediately. The entire load of uh, suspended dust is settled there, settled there. So it, had, it exactly happens in the, uh, in electron microscopy, you are right that you are doing two things, you are bombarding electrons, so that will also charge up, which is also not good. And also you are losing the, uh, uh, so, so electrons are uh, being lost because you are ejecting the electrons out, uh, but you are pumping electrons also. So net net charge is basically negative. Usually, that's the problem, yes. and it's a bigger problem. Uh, it's a bigger problem in SEM. In DM, it's not a big problem because DM uh, the, the answer lies in the, the answer to this great question is that uh, the DM sample DM sample loader is is a TM grid actually. Which is actually a uh, three millimeter uh, copper uh, grid. It's like this. It's a, it's a mesh of copper. Okay. So it's hollow, but it is copper. So it provides a conductive path to the sample holder. So it keeps on, and then it goes to the earth section. So that is basically earth. So any excess charge will be neutralized. But uh, but how can you suspend those few nanoparticles there because they can pop. So there is a uh, thin coating of uh, pipe and then coating, thick coating of uh, very thin of amorphous carbon on top of that. And there is a polymer also, foreign work kind of a polymer. So you have a amorphous polymer coating and there is a carbon coating. So because carbon coat, carbon is, amorphous carbon is electron transparent yes. to some extent. Because Z is very low. We explained in the first class, right? In the first class, the uh, electron interaction is proportional to the Z. Mm -hmm. huh? So uh, I explained that in the organic matters, the organic or you know, they are not they don't scatter much electrons, right? Hmm? That we covered, but we will be covering again in this. Don't worry about it. So, we'll be, so, so that's the reason that we, we don't have charging issue in the PEM. But in SEM, the problem is that SEM we do on this kind of solid blocks. So, uh, so ideally, what happens that we put, we test. Uh, so on this side we are we are bombarding the electron. So this side is is tested uh, uh, with the carbon uh, tape uh, to the metal uh, sample loader. So idea is that the charge accumulation should not happen. But if it is a if it is a metallic sample, some some conductivity is there, it's fine. Suppose it's a polymer, non-conducting polymer, or if it is a block of some silica or zirconia or titania and all kinds of uh, alumina, yes. uh, what will happen? Obviously, these are insulators. So electrons, even if you have put it on the carbon tape, but electron, uh, if it is accumulated here, will not be able to, it will keep on accumulating. What it will do, it will create a lensing effect. So if some fresh electrons are coming, so they will, it will repel them. So you will have a poor energy problem. Yes. And it is regularly seen in the SEM. SEM, standing electron microscopy, so biggest problem. So you have, look at this, this innocent question led me to such a big problem in electron microscopy. Is, is asking that deep questions actually. So, so it's the biggest problem in 
uh, scanning the chrome microscopy. And so what we will do that uh, to uh, answer your question that is another solution in, in scanning the chrome microscopy, they put the entire thing with the uh, 5 to 10 nanometer metal carbon. Not carbon, but gold, gold and yeah. metal, uh, palladium platinum. Okay. So they put a thin layer. So if you put uniformly only 10, 10 uh, nanometer, so what will happen is that all the area is shifted by same same thickness. So, so suppose you are looking at, you are interested in the topography of these metals. So this topography is not affected because you are uniformly lifting the entire background by 10 nanometer, same amount, right? And now uh, Sheetal can say that no, I am interested in the uh, chemistry of this also. What kind of atoms uh, are there? So, so then uh, you will get a lot of uh, platinum palladium peak also because you are putting that. So you have to, if you know that this is uh, this is the X, uh, metal which you have coated from outside, so you have to uh, consider. You have to blank it out. You have to mask those atoms, and you have to consider. Suppose you are putting putting those platinum plate, palladium on alumina, so you know that aluminum peak and oxygen peak is coming, and that any gold peak or something metal peak you have to ignore. So that is not part of your sample. That you that is just the coating material. Yes. Got it. So, yes. So the sample itself contains yes. the gold of platinum. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is the sample itself? Then there is no problem. There is no charge because these are metal. Then you don't need to. Uh, you will not have any problem because metal will collect uh, electrons and dis discharge them very effectively. Metal, there is no charging effect. This effect is not there. Only the problem now? Huh? It happens in polymers. Yeah. It happens a lot with polymers. And uh, with polymer, you can have damage, you can damage also polymers. I will show a lot of images. So uh, I think we discussed in the first class uh, the damage damages using electron P, right? You can have damages, right? So it, um, who asked this question? So, so what you asked this question about gold, right? Yes. Gold metal we discussed in the last class, right? So you can have actually the even quartz, which is actually uh, uh, crystalline silicon silicon oxide. Quartz is nothing but silicon oxide, right? Yes. So you can you can have bubble formation uh, if you bombard uh, iron electron using electron field, you can have part of that, you can have local heating. Quite a lot. So, in metals, what happens that heat, heat can uh, also escape. The metals are good conductor of heat, not just charge. So, metals can handle the heat accumulation in a better way. But, problem is the non metal conductive polymers and uh, is all these your alumina, silica, and all kinds of things, your uh, catalyst supported, you know, support, catalyst support will have a problem. And you can ask Prabhu about this problem. Uh, when you really uh, go deeper into your PhD, uh, many times students talk me in the corridor, so we are facing this problem, all of this problem. So good, good discussion, both of you, thank you. Any other questions? Sir, in order to resolve that thing. No, uh, uh, yes, you have to. Why don't you have a question? He is sleeping anyway. <coughs> You, you should have been fresh. Huh? Sir, I have one more question. Uh, I will first, uh, yeah. yeah. Because you already asked. Them. Yeah, it's a very small question. So, what like what's the difference between like you know performing the same experiment for like a conductor and polymer and performing it for a metal? Because both the conductor but to a different extent. So, if you take conducting polymer and metal, so what will be the dif difference? Yeah. So, see what information you're looking at. So you are, there are two kinds of information normally chemists look at. One is the topography, shape and size and form of the sample. Another is the chemistry, that what kind of atoms are present. And third is basically crystallinity, right? What is the ordering, right? Diffraction uh, uh, pattern. So uh, I would say that uh, when you use electrons, or even photons. So polymers naturally have a very weak signal because they they don't start they are lighter elements. So the signal from polymers will be going to be inherently very weak. 
very clear. In contrast to metals, metals uh, on periodic table they give beautiful signal. If you, if you put that in uh, light scattering, if you are doing DLS, dynamic light scattering, the particle size analysis, in storage bed slab, right, they give you beautiful uh, signal. If you take a polymer bead, the same size, 15 nanometer, 10 nanometer, and if you take metal bead of the same size, and if you let if you do the same light scattering instrument. Polymer bead will give you a very faint signal and metal bead will give you a beautiful signal. Same, same thing in electromicroscope, metals will give you a very good signal. And it, but it's also a problem. The problem is that uh, because polymers are not that electron absorbent, so you can take you can afford to take you can afford to uh, image even thicker uh, polymers. But the metal problem is that they will block the electrons very early with the very thin. So you cannot see if you are interested in uh, just the size, there's no problem. You can take any if you are interested in the inside information, inside crystallography or atomic uh, percentage information, then you need to you, you should be able to uh, transmit the electrons through the sample and capture them at the other side. Electrons should not remain just get uh, you know just block them. Otherwise you will get only the size information. If you just want size information, no problem. You you just look at the shadow effect. Right? Suppose this is a shadow effect. It will give you only size information, but it does not give you information about what is inside this ion. It just lacks you. For that, if I want to know inside information, electrons should transmit and I should be able to talk to them. Hey, what did you see? What did you see inside? So that's chemistry information I should. I will get only information if I can, <coughs> it is thin enough that I can, you know, probe those, if I can, what do you see? I should be able to probe those, know, those electrons which have gone through that and I will see whether they are elastic interactions or inelastic, inelastic interactions are very good for chemistry, for Z contrast, genes and I will discuss about this. X-rays are product of inelastic interactions, right? X-rays are produced only when there is energy transfer, right? Right? Huh? X-rays are produced only when there is an energy transfer. When you when you are throwing very high energy uh, electrons, some energy is transferred, electrons get kicked out, and then X-rays are formed from the four levels. Hmm? It's basic chemistry. So. Yeah. So some of these discuss these these steps we discuss uh, because it will take me 15 or 20 minutes. Because if you understand this, uh, you understand the entire class. Then no, there's no need to study further. Entire electron microscope because this this is what we need to know. All the modes are coming out of this. One. This as well as this. This this is basically the end of the. The next onium, onium B, onium layer. These three slides done. We will spend one hour on this, one and a half hour on these three slides. And we will have a lot of debate questions. And, uh, but I want to, uh, I don't want to take up the new slide. And uh, I will be happy to take questions.